Okay, besties, I want you to picture your bloodstream like a giant highway. Now imagine that traffic suddenly stops because somebody dropped this really big, huge glob of jelly, also known as a blood clot, directly in the middle of the road. Now that would be a major problem, but we're gonna enter our heroes, the anticoagulants. These medications don't just break clots apart, there's another crew that does that but they do help with preventing those new clots from forming by putting the brakes on the clotting factors in the coagulation cascade. This is that fancy chain reaction your body uses to form clots. So when do we actually call in our anticoagulant crew? We do this anytime that there's a risk of clots clogging up the flow, like with deep vein thrombosis, known as DVTs. That's when you have a clot in your leg. It could even be a pulmonary embolism, also known as a PE, and that's when a clot traps travels into your lung. We could see them used with ischemic strokes and transient ischemic strokes known as TIAs when we have a clot in our brain. And you can also see them when it comes to coronary artery disease known as CAD or heart attacks known as myocardial infarctions when we have clots in our heart. Going back to your medical terminology, it's really easy if you break down the word to understand what's happening with these particular medications. We have anti, which means against something, and coagulants, which means clotting. So if we combine them together, we have anti-clotting. We're against clotting. And we need that in order to keep that flow going through all of our blood vessels. So what are some other common reasons why we would use anticoagulants? Especially in the ICU settings, you can see it used with disseminated intravascular coagulation, known as DIC. DIC is when the body goes crazy. It goes into overdrive, forming clots everywhere, using up all the clotting supplies really, really fast. Anticoagulants can come in and they're gonna help stop that chaos and give the body a rest and chance to reset. Having worked in CVICU for many, many years, we see a lot with cardiac valve replacements as well. Typically, we see it with mechanical heart valves that are gonna be implanted. And when they're implanted, they actually trigger clots since the body sees these mechanical heart valves as foreign. Anticoagulants are gonna ultimately be used long-term to prevent stroke as well as any kind of valve blockage. And then of course, we have our coronary angioplasties. That's when we place stents inside of our blood vessels. It's a really cool process where a balloon is gonna be inserted into the blood vessel. It's going to open up that clog inside the artery and a stent is gonna be placed there in order to keep it open. Anticoagulants help prevent clots from forming on the new stent while it settles in. And here's the big key coming from a CVICU nurse. Sometimes we can have something called reocclusion, meaning that the blood vessel can reocclude even though the stent is there and block the blood flow. So you always want to keep a special eye on these individuals to make sure that we are potentially not having any additional harm to them. Another commonly seen procedure you can see them with is cardiopulmonary bypass. So during open heart surgery, a machine takes over for the heart and lungs. So we typically give them anticoagulants to keep that blood from clotting in the tubing of the machine. You can also see it with percutaneous coronary intervention known as PCI. And this is just another fancy way of saying angio plasty done through the skin. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation known as ECMO. It's really cool if you ever get a chance to see it. We use this really for our most critically ill patients because this ECMO machine helps oxygenate blood outside of the body. So anticoagulants help prevent that blood from clotting so that we don't risk, you know, clotting up our life-saving circuit. And then of course we have hemodialysis in patients typically with kidney failure. Dialysis helps filter out that blood through a machine. And of course, anticoagulants would make sense in those situations. One of the best ways I like to remember this is using the mnemonic blood safe, which stands for bypass, lung life support, overactive clotting, open vessels, dialysis, stents and valves, artificial hearts, foreign valve replacements, and emergency heart procedures. So what's one of our most common anticoagulants? It's heparin. Heparin is the most commonly used one in the hospital setting. It is considered a high alert medication because if it's given incorrectly, it can lead to very serious harm, especially when it comes to dangerous bleeding. So precision is going to be 
everything here. Heparin IV infusions are usually based on the patient's weight. And that means that we have to calculate the dose using the patient's body weight to make it safe and personalized as possible. Once that infusion is running, we monitor the patient's APTT, also known as activated partial thromboplastin time. This tells us specifically how well that anticoagulant is working and it helps us adjust the dose if needed. Another common lab that you see more commonly now, it seems like it's back on the rise, is known as heparin anti-XA. This particular lab measures the anticoagulant effects of heparin specifically, especially its ability to inhibit factor XA, which is a key protein involved in blood clotting. So safety check, because this heparin carries such a high risk of bleeding, we always want to use an electronic IV infusion pump in order to administer this medication. The pump is usually programmed in milliliters per hour, also known as mLs per hour, but heparin is dosed in units per hour. So we're gonna need to do a little bit of conversion in order to figure out how to provide this medication. So let's see how we're going to calculate giving an IV heparin-based infusion based on weight-based dosing. I want you to meet Nurse Noy. She's working in a busy shift in an intermediate medical care unit. One of her sweet patients today is Miss Edna. She is a sweet 76-year-old woman who's been diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. Remember, that means that she has a blood clot in her lungs. Nurse Noy is going to check Edna's electronic health record, also known as EHR, and finds that her current weight is documented as 76 kilograms. And her current baseline APTT is 37 seconds. This lab will help guide us as we dose and adjust our heparin. When you're caring for patients on the floor, you also want to double check what was administered in the emergency department. Because as we can see here, earlier in the ER, Enna had received a heparin bolus to kickstart her treatment. Now it's time for us on the floor to actually begin her continuous IV heparin infusion. So here is our order that we need to provide to Edna. We have a heparin 25,000 units and 500 mLs of 5% dextrose. And our starting rate is 18 units per kilogram per hour. So what does Nurse Noy need to figure out? As we said before, the infusion pump is gonna be programmed in mLs per hour. So Nurse Noy is gonna to have to calculate that infusion rate in mLs per hour to program it into the IV pump. But because the doctor ordered it in units per kilogram per hour, we need to do a little bit of conversion to figure it out. So as we always discuss, there are gonna be three options that you can do in order to figure out this medication math question. We either have dimensional analysis, basic formula method, or our ratio and proportion. In this video, we're gonna calculate using basic formula method. So using our basic formula method, we have desired over have multiplied by our vehicle, and we're also gonna multiply it by our weight to make this a little bit easier when we're trying to do calculation. So let's start with what we know. What is desired? We know that we want to give 18 units per kilogram per hour. What do we have available to us? What's the medication concentration? We have 25 thousand units. What's the vehicle? What kind of quantity is that medication available in? It's available in 500 mLs, and we know that our patient weighs 76 kilograms. This is great because we don't have to do a whole lot of conversion because our desired dose and our patient's weight are in the same conversion. So let's start plugging in. So starting with our desired dose, we want to give 18 units. What is available in, right? Remember, desired over have. So what do we have available to us? We have 25,000 units. What is the vehicle? What formula or how much? What's the quantity that it's available in? It's available in 500 mLs. And then for our last multiplication, we just need to input specifically how much the patient weighs, and they weigh 76 kilograms. Now we're just going to pull out our handy dandy calculator and do a little math. 18 divided by 25,000 multiplied by 500 multiplied by 76 is going to give us our correct answer of 27.36 
mLs per hour. Now here's the deal. Any time that you are programming an infusion pump, typically they only want you to provide a number in the tenths place. That's your first number behind the decimal. So because we have an additional number in the hundreds place, we would need to either round up or round down. In this case, because that number is higher than five, we're going to round up the number in front of it. So that means when we program our pump, we're going to program the pump to 27.4 mLs an hour to make sure that we have an accurate pump. If you're new to med math and you're having a little bit of a difficult time solving these dosage calculations, I recommend starting here. This is everything you need to know about how to solve these types of equations. As always, I'm going to catch you in the next video and I hope you have a wonderful day, besties. Bye.